Thank you very much for the chance of letting me to speak here. I really wish I could have started my talk by showing a picture of me standing on the shoulder of David, but we didn't get a chance to do that. So what I would like to talk about is quantum Turing test. But before going straight to the topic of my, oops, there is a reflection. So I want to say that what would Turing would say if he saw the advertisement um, of our uh, meeting here. Uh, his work had a strong influence in several fields, mathematics, logic, cryptography, and morphogenesis. I'm pretty sure he would say, wait a second, what about physics? And what I would like quickly mention is that it is not fair that we didn't put um, physics there because he actually influenced a lot of idea that we are dealing these days in physics uh, by Alan Turing again. So just to go quickly through the three topic, um, because... Uh, I had the blessing of being able to talk about my own research, so, but I want to mention quickly about some of the aspects that how is influenced by Turing and, and the physics aspect. So it's from computability towards physics. And as everybody knows, the whole concept of uh, church Turing is about capturing the concept of function whose values are effectively calculable. And this, this is a thesis in order to formalize what do we mean by this concept of effectively calculable. And this is, um, he, Turing himself is saying that this is a value can be found by some purely mechanical scheme. And when you put the word mechanical, you're already thinking about some notion of physics. And the student of Turing, Alan Gun uh, Robert Gandhi, started to bring in some of those notion of physics very concretely when he was talking about uh, some of the principle that he tries to axiomatize the church Turing thesis was causality and finite velocity of propagation of effects and uh, signals. This is very, very much a concept in physics and the no signaling, which is one of the essential principles in physics, which is uh, linked. And even further, um, uh, carry on is like the axiom that he's putting in order to formalize computability are all physici, if you like, boundedness, locality, determinacy. So physics was already there, and it was just later on that um, uh, David Deutsch, which is the founder of the field of quantum information, uh, started to look at this concept of the idea that Turing wants to, to capture a sort of naturally computable function is basically computed in nature. So that's, that's, that's as natural as we could think of uh, computation could be. And then, so he revised the um, church Turing thesis and mentioned this, this, this thing that he's, we are now referring to it as a principle. You know, in physics, a principle is also have the same status that you don't need to prove it, but is a, it's something that uh, is uh, believed to be uh, correct. And uh, the version of the um, uh, Deutsch is every finitely realizable physical system can be perfectly simulated by a universal model computing machine operating by finite means. This is just reformulating the church to thesis. And there are elements here, so when we're saying every finite or realizable is the part that nature comes to the picture. So we want to, we want to look at any theory that is experimentally uh, provable, so we can run the experiment. That's the, that's the act, aspect of the nature coming to the picture. But the other part, uh, the universal model, could be still remaining as, um, as a theoretical, but it still should be described uh, finitely. And uh, finally, the finite means, uh, sorry if I'm disturbed, because this, this thing has a very bizarre echo. Can I just shout, or it doesn't work? No. Okay. No, I hear my own reflection. That's, that's the thing. So um, the finite means is also defined axiomatically without any restrictive on the physical law. So I, I, I don't, I mean, it's, uh, we, uh, there are like meeting and meeting. We're just talking about this. This is very, very important. This, this move from just being computational to the physical, um, as you know, philosophers are talking about it. But it's, it's actually very interesting that I already, what the idea that Turing had initially, it was have the physics implicitly in, in there. So, and this, this game carried on, of course, you know, uh, 
as David mentioned, the computability theory is not changing. Anything that is computable, even within this um, more general physical terms, is still the same computability uh, according to the uh, church Turing thesis. But if you look at this other version that sometimes people call about the complexity church Turing thesis or the strong church Turing thesis, which was claimed that any, any computation that can be done if it's efficiently can be uh, simulated on a Turing thesis, we know that that is probably false because Quantum computing is believed not to be efficiently simulatable on a classical uh, machine. So the Bernstein Mazirani reformulated the strong church thesis were saying that any universal quantum Turing machine can be efficiently simulate any realistic model of uh, computation. So that's the complexity aspect of that, that for the first time we have a model which is not um, classically uh, efficiently complexity uh, wise uh, simulated. But people went further, further away when they look at this physical aspect. And there are people like Seth Lloyd in uh, MIT who are pioneering the idea of saying that, well, OK, let's, let's, let's go further. The ultimate uh, uh, thesis is that the universe is a computer. So we're talking about the full universe. And, and in, in a sense, the church Turing Deutsch principle provides a mechanism of verifying physical theories. That's, that's what is the main topic that I will talk about and is back all the discussion that we had about verifying the theory that comes to our uh, attention. And it's very interesting because it's linking computer science and physics very concretely. You know, that's, that's, that's what it was. When you're bringing a theory, it's something to run the experiment in the lab. It's something else about uh, verifying the result of experiment. But, but, but people... Uh, Talking about the simulation is, is just a verification. It's not presenting exactly what is happening in your theory. So um, Lucien Hardy from Perimeter Institute uh, proposed something even stronger, much, much stronger in a sense from the um, Deutsch principle, church Turing uh, principle, which is called the computational reflection principle. He's claiming it would it be possible to consider uh, this version that the behavior of any physical process is ac uh, accurately reflected by the uh, behavior of an appropriately programmed universal model computing device. So here, the key element is this reflected. And there is a whole paper to talk about formalizing what, what it actually means by this concept of reflection. And is, it's, it's basically trying to go inside the box, inside the ATM machine of uh, David, in a sense that we're not talking about just input-output correlation. We want to have the, some sort of mapping between internal structure of the physical process and the computation. And oh, in, in that sense, so it's not just I'm verifying that the output has come according to the theory prediction, but actually I really understand what is uh, going on in theory, and that's towards the seeing the universe as a computer. But the interesting part is that when uh, Hardy proposed such a principle, he already saw that it was actually maybe this is too strong and we need to be careful here. Because even if we extend the concept of computation to go beyond this just sort of input-output relationship and going to taking account all the new concept and get rid of causality to some extent because when we go to the quantum gravity, let me just pause that a second. We don't have a full theory of quantum gravity, but Hardy argued that even if we come up with the um, solid topic of solid theory of the quantum gravity and build the computational model on top of that, the concept of causality will be not easily dealt with with the same sort of the normal machine that we have classical and quantum. So he gave. Uh, um, Explanation. These are none of them are true and uh, are theory or proof, but he's saying that actually um, this strong uh, reflection principle cannot be valid because quantum gravity would would not be able to be simulated with such a machine that is reflecting all the internal structure. However, from the complexity point of view, it's believed that this quantum uh, gravity computer can be even more powerful uh, than the. Um, quantum computer. So basically the only quick point that I wanted to mention is this, this, this sort of this game carries on and now there is a, a new approach when we're talking about the physics theory that each time, one of each time that this physics theory making a big boost and bringing quantum uh, theory to the picture, the model based on it could completely change our perspective on complexity theory. The quantum gravity could be completely again uh, change our perspective. But it seems somehow the computability is not touched and that's 
that's sort of very interesting that, you know, uh, the, the church during thesis is strong against the various theory of the physics that is coming, although it's hard to be proving. So let me change the gear from that and go to the other topic that was very dear to Alan Turing, what is uh, cryptography. Everybody knows him as a, a great uh, code breaker. He pioneered the statistical techniques to optimize the trial of different possibility in the code breaking. And the same way that in the computability theory, the idea of naturally computable function was replaced by the computed in the nature. So what happened recently is that we have learned to how to replace the concept of secure by computation, which is what the normal classical cryptography is about, by secure by the nature. Again, how the physics comes to the picture. We're not talking about them anymore, the computational security, building our code which is based on hard factoring numbers. We're talking about something that is secure because quantum mechanics is correct, because the axiom of physics out there are exactly like that. So I have no doubt that Alan Turing would fall in love with the quantum cryptography, which described the use of um, quantum mechanical effect to perform uh, quantum, um, to, perfect, uh, to perform a cryptography task or to actually break uh, cryptography. Well, we are not involved in any war right now, but I'm sure, you know, uh, that, <laughs> well, not yet, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> let's let, so, uh, but, but it's like this, this would be, uh, this would be the other uh, attack for all the breaking codes which would be there and would have been nice to have him around. So, well, uh, just a quick uh, recap of the history of uh, quantum cryptography. So it started with the idea of um, Weisner when the first time that the link between secrecy and the quantum mechanic uh, was put forward, he proposed this um, uh, quantum money paper, which is very interesting because it was not published since the field of quantum cryptography didn't exist. And people like in the 1970s, people like, well, this is completely science fiction. So he proposed a very interesting uh, idea. It's like, you know, when you have the bill, this bill which is issued by the bank will have some randomized photon, you know, as being printed in, in your bill. And because the principle of um, uncertainty tells you that if you're not the person who is preparing this photon in this random polarization, you will not be able to completely guess what was that photon is. So, so this is like unforgeable money. Well, there is issue of like how to keep your photon you know, completely coherent in your pocket for a long time and do exchanging it. But the idea is so key that it actually is the foundation of every other cryptography idea that comes afterward, the bennett Brassard. 84 and uh, Eckert 91 quantum key distribution, which is solving the way of how to um, party uh, communicate, communicate publicly and end up to have a um, secret uh, uh, shared secret key, is really based on the but this uh, usage of uncertainty principle of if you don't know in which direction your random uh, photon has been uh, prepared, you won't be able to make the perfect test in order to distinguish that. So that was just the, and the same the way that Bennett and Brassard also had a very hard time to publish their paper because they were defining the field and they, you know, all these famous journals rejected that, uh, they, uh, the paper and they managed to publish it in some sort of invited conference in India and that's one of the most cited paper in our field. So, and then uh, the, the game carry on. I'm just very quickly mentioning some of the things comes. There was the quantum secret sharing uh, coming in uh, 99, which was showing the idea of how you distribute the data in such a way that only some authorized party can, can access them. Uh, and, you know, the usual, uh, the usual story that, you know, like uh, unless all those three parties are there, they won't be able to recover. So again, the secrecy of the data using the quantum effect. There was lots of no-go result, like the bit commitment is not possible, uh, oblivious transfer is not possible, but then there is other positive result again that are coming recently that perfect quantum coin flipping is impossible, but better than classical protocol exists. And these are not just the fact that what I was hopefully during the talk can, can convey you, they are not just the fact that, okay, we have now a efficient, uh, secure cryptography type of new protocol to go and try to implement them. They are just actually tell you something about the physics, about the nature. They, in fact, they are so interesting that when quantum mechanics was put forward 100 years ago and people like Einstein already hate this idea of this entanglement, spooky action, what is it about? But the interaction with the field of cryptography and computation is, it's 
helping us to re-understand all this concept of entanglement, all of this weirdness of quantum mechanic. So this also is not just an application, it's just helping it towards the understanding. So this, this sort of result, we're just showing you why, why in the classical world we cannot do this coin flipping and somehow we're getting a better bias. Tell us about this transition between classical and quantum mechanics, which is one of the big open questions in the field. And my, my own research, uh, which is showing the, recently we showed that there is possible to have unconditional secure quantum homomorphic encryption scheme, which will be the main part of the talk. So quantum Turing test is the another part that you know, uh, Turing, in a sense, uh, set up uh, the link to the physics. So this is, uh, as we already heard, what is the Turing test. So what I'm proposing as the quantum Turing test is that, OK, you want to distinguish between whether this is a classical computer or is the quantum computer, and, and with the same sort of interaction to distinguish it. OK, this is not the $64 million grand challenge of David, but it is $10 million worth uh, challenge. And one of the reasons this is important is because there are companies like D-Wave who are building quantum computer. They are a commercial company. They're not telling tell you what is their technology inside there. They are not publishing any paper. They're not revealing anything. So you want to know before buying this computer what's going on there. OK. Don't run, don't run. I can do it. I can do this, I promise I can do this. Okay, so, so it is like one of the very practical aspects of quantum Turing test is that if I'm going to pay, and some people have paid for this, uh, $10 million to buy this quantum computer, how do I know it's actually a quantum computer? You know, is, is, is it really, really quantum effect? Or is it really, uh, so you would say, okay, it's easy, I'll, I'll just, make it to the box to factor a big number. We know that there is no efficient way of factoring a number in the classical world, so I just factor it, and if it's a good one, so I'll pay the money. But obviously, this is not solving your quantum Turing test, because this sort of test are just testing for a very specific task. You're just, you're just testing that this computer probably is able to factor number. It might be actually a very classical computer. The guy have managed to find out an algorithm as now selling it for $10 million to you. So it's, it's, it's just proving to you nothing, this sort of test. And the whole point is that, the whole interesting point about the quantum computing is that we don't even know all the problem that a quantum computer can solve for us efficiently are classically testable. So this, 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 is, this is the question that is, in a sense, is, although it's linked to the practical usage, but in, you, can, you can push it further, further. It's like, can we actually test quantum mechanics? And that's where all the interpretation of the quantum mechanics and all the foundational question uh, it comes. So it was a great, great discovery. I mean, unfortunately, I'm not going to go through it. It's when, when, when people like Einstein, uh, Polonsky, and all the people said, OK, entanglement is weird. Quantum mechanics is probably not correct. There is this spooky action of the correlation. It was a very, very important discovery of a mathematician called Bell, John Bell, who presented a simple mathematical test. If you like, you can call it that was the beginning of the uh, quantum Turing test that shows that OK, there is no other classical non-local theory which could predict and produce the same sort of statistical behavior that the quantum mechanics bring it forward. And then people get really excited because it was a mathematical proof, and they actually went ahead and implemented it. Uh, and Alan Aspic was one of the first uh, experimental physicists who implemented this Bell test. Okay, and there is some loophole there, and this is like the grand challenge in our field to get rid of this loophole to show that, look, quantum mechanic is correct, and this is the proof of it, and no classical hidden variable model could explain this to you. But here we need to pose that despite the fact that all this sort of test has been implemented with utmost uh, precision, these are not necessarily scalable. Maybe. The question is that, okay, we believe three or four particles behave the same way that when you have 100 or 200 particles. So if I prove to you quantum mechanics of two particles behave like this, so you should shrug your shoulders and say, well, okay, quantum mechanics is correct, and if it's like 100, it should be the same. But no, maybe it's not the same. I mean, if you want to very, very precise. And the, the point is, like, if, if once you go to the 100 or 200 particles, your Hamiltonian, unless it's Hamiltonian or this, whatever it means, is this, this system is not 
solvable analytically, you can no longer to run this sort of test. You can no longer run an experiment in the lab, get the data, then calculate with your pen and paper the uh, exponential computation cost of this uh, prediction of quantum mechanics and say that yes, quantum mechanics is correct. So basically, proving whether quantum mechanics is correct cannot be anymore left in the hand of experimental physicists. It's too important that we let them to do that. You know, it's, uh, because they, they it's, and it's, the point is that it just actually is an issue of a complexity. It's not possible. You need to come up with a different type of test to be able to do that. And that's, that's what I'm uh, suggesting the quantum Turing test is, is you need to bring some sort of cryptography, you need to bring all the other techniques to deal with the exponential regime that, that we have there. So basically the main question that a lot of a lot of people in the field of, you know, a lot of us pretending that we're doing quantum computing because we want to build faster computer and there is cryptography. But if you really talk to everybody who works in the field, we are interested in this. We want to understand is nature is really quantum or not, and how could we demonstrate uh, such a things. And this this question can be also presented in the complexity uh, formalism of the interactive proof system. You have the quantum prover, you have the classical verifier. They are given the question, and at the one end, you want to have this say yes satisfied. So in such a setting, the question that was uh, raised by Gottsman and the grand challenge of twenty-five dollar of Scott Aronson was that does every language in the class BQP bonded polynomial quantum computation admit an interactive proof system where the prover uh, is having a quantum computer, but you verify is BPP, is a classical bonded uh, computation. So, so the answer to all of this question is yes, we can. Uh, and if you combine idea of quantum computing with the quantum cryptography, you get this notion of blind computing or homomorphic computation. You're able to run a computation and, on your server such that the server has no knowledge about it. So we designed this protocol. Uh, which your client, your Alice, is classical computer plus a little bit of quantum, which is a single qubit generator. I'll talk about it later. They communicate to the server. Server will, uh, uh, we achieve the unconditional perfect uh, privacy. So that's, that's important. So first of all, the security, as I mentioned again, is in cryptography, is not based on something being hard. It's based on the, uh, again, uh, uncertainty principle of, uh, of quantum mechanic and uh, the server will learn nothing about the client's input-output computation. So you could think of all the application point of view of like uh, homomorphic encryption. But the, the very begin, the crux of my talk, and whenever I get to it, is that the fact that the server doesn't know anything about the computation will allow you to test it. So that's, that's where the uh, testing uh, picture comes through. Okay, so how does this, this uh, protocol work? This protocol is working based on something which is called measurement-based quantum Turing machine. So without trying to attempt to explain quantum computing, but this, this, this should be a very familiar picture. So we have a quantum tape, uh, which is holding our quantum data for manipulating them. Then we have a classical transition function for formalizing this classical control in the same way that you, know, you have the program in a, a Turing machine. And then you have the heads, which is the interacting between the classical and the quantum port, which is uh, ac works according to the measurement postulate, whatever it is. We don't need to go through, through the details of it. But the important part is like when you think about quantum computation, this sort of Turing, uh, Turing machine uh, picture, you're already separating the program, which is a classical, which is running a computation, and the power, which is your uh, computational power, which is the quantum, which is your tape. This separation is very essential for the target of the protocol that we want to put. So basically, you put your client to be the classical control machine to take care of the program, the server to be the resource, the quantum tape uh, to run the computation, and this separation will allow you to run this uh, client-server setup. So the only thing that it has to be done is the hiding the angle of measurement and the result of measurement. So it's until now, I'm just telling you blah, blah, blah. So I want to do two slides of just actually doing some little bit of, uh, tiny little bit of science. Though. But if you understand this, this part, you know, you get the crux of like how the things works in the quantum mechanics. So it's like, and why we can hide, why we can uh, achieve this sort of cryptography protocol. So this is like my picturing of like, it's a very mini quantum Turing uh, machine. So you have your tape. These are your photon. These are, these are in some sort of entangled state, which is like in the, Classical vector space means this. So, 
either you know what it is or not, it's just like a vector. So, and then you have the program, which is this parameter alpha, which tells you that, okay, go to the position of the head and you perform this measurement. This is a probabilistic, with probability half you apply this projection or probability half you apply this other projection. Okay, that's, that's the process of, you know, shining a photon, heating to a detector. The detector is either doing a projection to the up uh, polarization or down polarization, for example. And after that you have performed this, your uh, new configuration of your Turing machine will be like a new quantum state. The quantum state is the application of some metrics, which is called unitary operator on your input in this particular case, and some classical bits which comes out of your measurement, which is up and down, which, which is influencing the way that your computation can be interpreted. Okay, so that's the way that a normal our measurement-based uh, quantum computing works. So now if, if our client comes and wants to hide things, because remember, we just need to hide the program to be able to, to go ahead, it needs to hide the parameter alpha, so you choose a random theta, and you see why, and it wants to even hide these classical bits S, which is coming in the uh, output configuration, and it choose another random parameter R. And this very simple randomization, so, the initial qubit are not anymore whatever I was showing before. It's like some sort of one one. There is some sort of rotation, you know, pre rotation that has been performed. It's completely random. And now your program has been slightly changed. This program is not alpha, it's this theta which is there and this r pi randomization. The effect of all of this is that now when you look at the outcome, your classical bits is now has this randomization in it, and your computation is also have this randomization. So without going through the details, basically what has happened, by classical one time padding the angles and the outcome, we can show that the quantum output has been now one time padded. So this is a very, very simple idea. It's just by these two simple randomization, now the state that the server has prepared for us is completely encoded. And completely encoded is like, you know, in the normal one-time padding, the equivalent of in the quantum one-time padding, meaning that despite the fact that the server is the person who's holding this quantum tape for us, has revealed no information from his point of view. This is totally mixed state. It's basically, it's like whatever random guess he could have uh, guessed without any information. So that's, that's the perfect um, security in the sense that because you don't know, and the security I'm not telling you, but precisely is here. When I'm giving you a photon which is randomized in a particular polarization, if you don't know in which polarization I have randomized it, you have no knowledge about it. And if you don't know this theta, you don't know that alpha, and if you don't know that alpha, everything is one-time pilot code. It's just absolutely simple. And is that, that's the beauty of everything in the quantum mechanic. In a sense, weird, but it's very, very simple. So that's the protocol, so basically, Alice is preparing lots of these sort of random photons sent into the server. The servers entangle them. Then the analysts need to do some sort of little calculation, which is this one-time padding of the angle. Send that encoded information to the server. Server pay for measurement, sending it back. And all of the measurement is also one-time padded. And the blindness is the fact that any classical information that the server is obtaining during the protocol are independent of the actual program that the, uh, Alice wants to implement. And the quantum state that is obtained is also fixed. So it's basically, the server is sitting there, and the information he's obtaining is independent of what is, uh, what is happening. So we carried on in order to prove that this, this is actually very uh, realistic. We implemented it is with the Vienna group of Anton Seilinger. Uh, this is the four qubit version of it. Uh, so these are the random photon, which was a grand challenge for the physicists to create this sort of randomization. So this is the client, which in this this is what is called the parametric down conversion. It's creating two photons. It's uh, randomizing. It's bringing it out, doing entanglement, doing a, a, a measurement. So, so we were very excited. And of course, all this sort of publication with the famous physicists in science bring you fame. But they also bring you shame in a second. I'll tell you why. So first, uh, first, <coughs> first, uh, we got a nice, you know, BBC cover talking about oh, this is so. BBC being BBC and British, and they were careful enough to like, perhaps could head towards the unconditional secure quantum cloud and part of it. But then, then things get a bit more messy. So there was some Computer Scotland journal which saying it, I don't know if it's taking it as a compliment or what. It's like, the, it's like three of them were women who did this research. <laughs> this, this, this is really surprising, but it gets really strange. So, 
some, some other journal is talking about this will make the concerns surrounding Iran's nuclear effort seem trivial by comparison. I have no idea how they link it to the nuclear Iran, but I just hope none of the immigration officer read this blog <laughs> or I'll be troubled when I go back home. So, so this games is just going around, you know, this quantum cloud, quantum cloud and part of it. I mean, it's, 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 it's embarrassing because it's a good science, but now some, some people really look at us and like, you know, I really claim it, and I have nothing to do with quantum cloud. It's nice, but, well, anyway. So that's, that's the way it is. But um, one other thing that is more interesting that nobody, none of this media was picking up on that, of course, is that you know, we also put, up, put forward a very, very basic, what I like to call the quantum Turing test. So if, if your target is to understand whether your server has any quantum technologies, not just basically a machine sitting there randomly tossing a coin, and, because at the end, my interaction with this black box is just giving me bits. So are these bits really calculated according to some quantum technology or just some, some random bits? So I like to be on the client side to be able to test such a things. So we show that through the data, this magnificent piece of data that is uh, computed is that there are some particular setup that the distribution are this particular yellow and green uh, line, taking into account of the uh, imperfection of the noise that's coming in the experiment. And the best guess that the server could do in order to fool us would be this red line. So this is just beginning of looking at the statistical uh, difference between the actual data coming out of a lab with the um, uh, cheating servers coming out. So this is, is a very, very weak, you know, is, uh, we're just uh, probabilistically showing it, but it's the first stage of, in the terms of looking at the experimental data and the actual data. But it's obvious that this is, this is not gonna work because your server might have some sort of quantum technology trying to boost better uh, uh, statistic in order not to really do the random guess of a classical one. And also it could be the case that when this data is bigger and bigger and bigger, the client cannot anymore produce, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, it's not about like produce this statistic using your um, classical computer and then try to compare it. No, we're reaching to the limit that this is not anymore possible. So we need to come completely with a different type of test. And also, it's not just about testing, apart from the, I want to see that whether server is cheating or not. I want to know that whether this data which is produced is not correct or not. Imagine if maybe your server is even honest server and telling what is doing it, but may, there is lots of things happening, there is the coherence, there is noise. How do I know that this computation that has produced is actually a correct computation and I can use it? So that's, that's, the, <clears throat> that's the idea of the, uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes, okay. We say 10 minutes and we see how it goes. So, uh, uh, <laughs> verification. So, so the concept of verification is exactly trying to come up with a capture. So what do we want? We want to make sure if there was no cheating server, there was no interference, nothing, everything is going according to the plan, then the client accept and he said, okay, that's fine. I mean, I'm going to get that data. But, and as we know that there will be always um, some exponentially small possibility that you know, we accept this data, but this is the wrong one. If we don't put this thing, we can't do anything. This is exactly like the setting of interactive pro system. If you just go to this exact setting, then it's, it's, you cannot verify anything. But if you allow this exponentially small chance of things going wrong and then, then you repeat the computation, then, then we are in business. Then we can do something, and that's, that's the interesting part. Okay, let me... Uh, this is a bad thing to do, but I'll do it. No, 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 no. So this, this is the way it works, but basically, basically what we want to capture this concept of verification is that, okay, there is this protocol goes. Alice has some sort of random choice for her strategy. Bob is having some, some random choice of a strategy. Then there is this density operator. Think of it as like the, 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 uh, the description of the distribution, the probabilistic distribution of what has happened, the tape, the transcript of communication between Alice and Bob. So I'm writing this one is some sort of quantum description, but it's basically nothing but just showing that what is the sta uh, status of the computation afterward. We want to make sure for any strategy that the server can have, any malicious possible attack the server want to have, the client 
if it accepts uh, the probability that the client accepts an incorrect outcome is bounded. So you come and tell me how much you can tolerate as being fooled, and we want to make sure that we can uh, control it. And that's, that's, that's um, the reason I'm putting this formula up there, because this is exactly the sort of things that we do in the classical model checking, and we want to have some sort of uh, statistical guarantee that, okay, if I look at this, this is over all the possible strategy that Alice and Bob could, uh, could have had, depending on the uh, transcript of your computation, the probability that I have gone into the wrong subspace is bounded by epsilon. And in the, in the usual way of the cryptography, once you get the definition right, the proof is just like just trying to prove it. You know, it takes us a long time to, uh, to say that why this is the right definition because it's composable, so hence if this protocol is part of another protocol, the whole the property that you want to come. But basically the concept is that you want to make sure on the average, whatever is happening, the probability of going into the wrong subspace, which we can formalize it in terms of a mathematical operator, is uh, limited. And that's what we could do. So what is the idea? How are you doing it? So the idea is to take advantage of the blindness, finally. That's the whole point. So the fact that the server has no clue what is running, is not have no information, if it's like which computation is doing, what is the input, what is the output, where are the information, that is the way that I can take advantage to ask the clever question to make sure whether it's a really quantum computer or whether it's a really classical computer. So we're running this computation. These are the, all those rotated qubits that I'm sending to the server. Server is manipulating them, entangle them, running the computation. Within those computation, I can put some sort of trap. It's like the simplest possible idea that you could, you could imagine. So we're putting this trap. This trap are in such a way, whatever, they are, they are isolated. So they are like everything else are connected and they are part of my computation. But there are points that I'm digging a hole. And for these, these holes, there is some procedure. It's like, because I know, back to the uh, uncertainty principle, the person who prepared this random rotation can make a measurement which is precisely tell that what was that rotation. So if I give you some random rotation and you don't know which it is, then you're just going to make some sort of test and trying to measure it and then some probability you get it right or not. But if I tell you that I prepared this photon in this direction, go and measure it in this direction, you know that the outcome should be zero. Exactly, that, that was the up or down. So I am the person who's putting all those traps and then I'm asking my server to make a measurement on those traps. And these parameter theta are exactly the same, so I know what should be the outcome. So these are the tests. So as long as, so what is the point? As long as you don't know where are the trap that I put it and what was the angle of the trap I put it, you cannot do better than random guessing. But on the other side, I know exactly what should be the answer of the question. This is the tricky question I'm asking you, which I know the answer. So the moment you uh, answer it wrongly, I know that you, you have, you're doing something naughty. You're, you're not following the protocol or you, you have no idea of part of it and things. So that's, that's basically the uh, communication that we're putting forward in order to, to run the Turing test. And then, this, this, then you know, what you do usually in order to increase the probability of detecting, you're putting a lot of a lot of this trap and then, uh, and on top of that, in order to take care of that, the noise, this is, this is the interesting part, because the, the cheating server could be a good server, but it could be the nature that now is cheating on you. So, so this, this is happening in nature. So you, you cannot distinguish whether the nature, the actual implementation is creating the noise and is messing up the computation or the server. You cannot distinguish between them. So you need to put this sort of idea of fault tolerance in order to protect to some sort of threshold. When you put all these things together, uh, you get the idea. So, so that's the, for example, if that's the computation you want to do, that's the encrypted data you can, you can run. So you encode it to, the, the data is not important, you encode it in this uh, generic structure. When I'm giving you this structure, you don't know exactly, maybe the link to the graph of what David is showing you. So I'm putting it in such a symmetric way that out of this symmetry, you cannot detect any information about it because it's not, you don't know where is my actual computation, where is the other one. And then you're putting lots of trap, again, in the same sort of symmetric structure. It needs to be the same sort of symmetric structure. And you put all this symmetric structure together, and you can't show this to your experimental friend. They think that you're mad if you ask them to create this, uh, 15 complete uh, uh, graph to be able to test quantum mechanics, but we'll see where it goes. So, so you pick up this generic structure and with this blind manipulation of measurement, 
you, you can create trap and computation out of it. And the whole point is the blindness will be in such a way that the server who's doing this computation doesn't know whether he's working with this qubit or with the actual computation. And I know exactly the answer of computation for this part, and I put enough of this thing, when if everything yes is there, then the probability that this part to be wrong is bounded by epsilon. So that's all the things coming together, the part of it. So, um, and back to the, okay, so back to the question of whether we can do it completely classically, and then you can show that if you have two of this server with this thing which is called entanglement, and if they don't communicate, then, then you can run the same collection such that Alice being completely classical, but that's not really important. Let me go uh, to, the, to the final perspective. So basically, what we know that we can do, at least in theory, not yet in the experiment, is that we can run a quantum Turing test. We can run the quantum Turing test, but what, we, but is, what is interesting is that to run this quantum Turing test is not completely classical. The question that this classical observer is supposed to ask from this classical machine or quantum machine need to be either this random polarized photon or something else that I didn't, I mentioned it quickly, like non-commuting entanglement. So one of the most interesting question for me is to find what is the lower bound. Not from the complexity point of view, which although is very, very interesting, but it's also from the point that do we really, really, I think I put it here, do we really, really need a bit of quantumness to be able to test quantum, or it's possible to do it classically? And it has all sorts of interpretation regarding the quantum uh, mechanic interpretation, and also regarding the practicality of, you know, if you really need the quantum, then, then how do you trust that quantum resources already is not cheating a part of it? Can we have some sort of device independence or not? And back to the original question, is nature classically verifiable? So just finish with the perspective for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, any questions? Um... So, <clears throat> I'm still, my knowledge of quantum computing is stuck uh, 10 or 15 years back, but is there any progress on what, in my opinion, is a fundamental question of whether there is a provably non polynomial problem that uh, becomes tractable in the quantum? I mean, Shor's algorithm for factoring is a problem which might have a polynomial time algorithm. That, that's the main thing, in my opinion. Uh, to tell whether quantum computing will be well, uh, it's, strong. It's, uh, that, that's one of the biggest uh, results recently was, was showing that it's not in the same sort of like really separating complexity classes or we, we show that BQP is definitely outside of the BPB. But one very surprising result by Scott Aronson is showed that there are some sort of sampling problem that you can prove that this sampling problem, which can be efficiently sampled using the quantum statistics, cannot be used, uh, the, same, the same sort of distribution cannot be produced by any classical computing unless the polynomial hierarchy will collapse. So this sort of sampling, is already we know that if you go to this setting, and this is not very easily decidable <coughs> type of question to come to our complexity, but it's talking about like there is a clear separation between the quantum and the classical part of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I actually had a few. Um, I was concerned about, uh, you, you mentioned homomorphic encryption. Um, I only know a little bit about it from Gendry's 2009 uh, papers when I was at Hopkins. And I was curious, when, when you're doing these um, computations, how are you um, doing like additive or multiplicative operations in the sense because you mentioned one time pad which would mean there's no entropy between qubits is that right? So, so let me just uh, put it in the context so Gantry scheme is uh, providing uh, computational security whereas our mm -hmm. scheme is providing uh, unconditional security his scheme is for the classical function ours scheme is for the quantum function in what sense is that the separation, so in the again, interesting is important, the client will be as some sort of logarithmic space computation versus a polynomial space. Whereas our separation is that the classical, the client is classical and the, the server is, uh, is quantum. So it, we have been working a lot to trying to compare the two. It's a bit of an orange and apple comparison. So you could, of course, use our scheme to do homomorphic encryption of a classical function and you achieve, achieve the same sort of unconditional security. But the, the the arguing that, okay, now the server is more powerful than the, uh, um, the client, it doesn't make much sense because the client still needs to do some sort of BPP computation. So 
short answer, yes, it is possible. Is you can run, you can pick up this scheme and run the classical function with it. But the answer is that well, we are not sure. Are you achieving uh, um, the target of having this uh, huge separation between classical and quantum, the classical uh, client and server? I don't know if I answer your question. It, it's like yeah. it's in, in terms of universality, it's a universal model. So whatever function that you come, it comes, and and the scheme is so different because. It's no longer about some sort of encoding and uh, and decoding and hence uh, this sort of bootstrapping that again interesting is is game. It's just it's just a simple one time pattern and, and just going through. But as a result, the communication that you need between client and the server will be of polynomial lengths. Whereas in Gentry scheme, there is no communication. You just give you encoding, you run the computation, and give it back. So there is something still need to be done to see how the two can be combined. And I don't know the answer. To that. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Question. Has anyone taken $25 of Scott Harris? We get $15. We've got 15 <laughs> Because the, the challenge was that whether you can classically, completely classically verify. And because we need to send a couple of photons, so we, there's the $10 up there for grab. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Ellen. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.